Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good, I hope. Uh, I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church Hebron. My name is Sandy Ward, and I get the honor and privilege to say hello to you today and welcome you here. Thank goodness the Lord is good. The sun is trying to shine, and I'm so excited about that. I'm also excited about being to share with you, being able to share with you. Um, I, I know that I'm supposed to choose a song. These were very hard tasks for me because I'm old. And because I'm old, I've heard a lot of hymns. I've heard a lot of songs, and I love them all. But uh, Sweet Hour of Prayer, I think, would be my song. And I, I think sometime today we're going to sing that, okay, which is good. So also, I'm supposed to choose a word. I don't have a word, okay? I'm too, <laughs> I'm too scattered, I suppose. Um, the thing that uh, I think we're going to be talking about, and the song was about prayer, and um, prayer, uh, praying, is a good word to have. Um, it's a mystery to me. I enjoy it when I'm spending time with the Lord and when I realize that he and I are there together and that we can have this time, a special time together. So anyway, that would be my word if I really you know, felt strongly about it. I just throw that out to you. I hope that you are praying. I hope you do have that special time when you go into your closet or you go into a special place that you have and, and pray with him and talk with him and listen. Uh, my verse of scripture is Psalm 139, and I know that some of you probably know that one, uh, but it has a special meaning for me because I was a very, very lonely place, and um, I was having difficulty. Um, it was in a hospital, and people didn't seem to know who I was, and it, I was having a difficult time, and, and so I, I prayed, Oh, Lord, let there be a Gideon's Bible in the drawer here, and there was. And so I picked it up and turned to Psalm 139. And so the Lord, let, he just really uh, impressed on my mind that this was true of me at that time. Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I stand up. You understand my thoughts from far away. You observe my travels and my rest. You are aware of all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know about it. Lord, you have encircled me. You have placed your hand on me. This extraordinary knowledge is beyond me. It is lofty. I am unable to reach it. But God did let me know that day and every day that he knows exactly where I am. His hand is on me. He has encircled me. And if I trust him, then I have nothing to fear, do I? And you don't either. So I just pray that this might be meaningful to you if you're ever in a situation where you feel totally alone, where you're, you're fearful, or you, you're just, you seem to be lost, then I would go to the Word of God, and this is a good scripture to go to. So let me pray for us, and we will begin, okay? Father, we just bow before you this morning. We thank you so very much that you are quite aware of everything that we do and say and where we are and what's going on in our lives. And I, I pray that you will impress on each person today that, uh, that you are here that you are, if they are a believer, that you're living in them and that you're with them all the time. And even if not, that you're present and you are very much concerned with them and very much love them. And I pray that they will uh, listen to your word today and be uh, convicted of things you might need to give up or turn away from and that you'll be uh, convinced that the Lord loves you very much and that he has total good in mind for you. And so I thank you for this time and I pray it in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, amen and amen. And thank you. Thank you, Sandy. That is awesome. Would you all stand if you're able and we want to sing that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
That is one that I remember singing as a little kid. I really do. And my grandparents loved that hymn. And that's an awesome thought. Sweet hour of prayer. And it's amazing that we get to speak with the creator of the whole universe. That he would listen to me that he listens to you above all powers above all kings above all nature and all created things above all wisdom and all the ways of man you were here before the world began Above all, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what lay behind the storm to live and die rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth and treasures of the earth, there's no way to measure what you're worth. Took to fall 
and taught me above all like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all
God is good. Amen. Try again. God is good. And all the time. Yeah, and that's a good song. That's a great good song. Thank you, Sandy, for getting us started. On the right track, uh, I am going to be in uh, 1 Timothy. We're in our series called Christian Strong. And uh, you'll remember uh, from, from our, uh, our time in chapter 1 that Timothy was struggling. He was a young guy, and he was in a, at a church that was very difficult there in Ephesus. And, you know, many of the congregation were older and maybe even wiser than him. But yet the task of pastor was on him, and he wanted to run away. Uh, pastors are running away at an unbelievable rate in today's world, and there's some reasons why. And, and Paul is going to help get to those reasons why. I remember there was a movie that came out in 2000. It turned into my favorite sports movie. That's hard to do when you know all the good sports movies that are out there. You know, Hoosiers and Rudy and, you know, all those great movies about sports. And, uh, and yet in 2000, a movie came out and it was based on a true story. It was called Remember the Titans. And it was, uh, it, was, it was about those times in high school when you were, if you, if you were like me, you put on the tools of ignorance that they call a football uniform. And you, uh, you allowed yourself to be subject to uh, coaches that would uh, get you in shape for the battle. And uh, there's, there's a couple of great scenes in there, but the story uh, comes out of 1971. And they were desegregating this school in Alexander, Virginia. And this school had been a, a perennial power under the coach, uh, Bill Yost. And they had every year kind of gone to the state and won the state. They were an unbelievable football team. They were all white. And so now they're desegregating the school. And here comes all these uh, black kids. And, and they brought in a coach to take over uh, Bill uh, uh, Yost's spot and make him number two man, and they brought in a guy named Herman Boone. And Herman Boone was a self-described mean cuss. And he was a black coach. And, uh, and the story begins there. And it's a great story. It's a great story about leadership. It's a great story about, uh, a, about uh, segregation. It's a great story about bigotry. It's, it's an unbelievable movie, really. In, in so many ways. It took place in T.C. Williams High School, Alexander, Virginia. But there's a scene that brought back a lot of memories for me. And uh, I, don't know, I don't know how many of you guys uh, played football uh, in high school, but there's always that time. And it's the end of practice. And you've beat each other up. You've been out there pounding against each other, running plays and and, and running laps for mistakes you made and all kinds of different things and you're hot and you're sweaty and uh, back in my day instead of a drink of water they gave you a salt pill right here's how to kill a person they, they, they desperately need water you give them a salt pill and you just keep going you just keep going but then they line you up it's the last thing they do in practice and you're beat and they line you up in rows so you look like rows of corn and the coaches just walk down the rows. And you know what you're doing the whole time? You're running in place. They got you running in place. And every time they blow the whistle, you hit the ground. They blow the whistle again, you roll over. They blow the whistle again, you jump back up. And you better be in line when you jump back up. Because if you're not in line, they're going to smack you and take you out and make you run again somewhere else. And they talk to you while they're doing that. And in the movie, they're running. And uh, Coach Boone says, who are you? So we're the Titans. What are you? He said, we're mobile, hostile, and agile. And, and, and they're dying, right? And he just keeps going and going and going. Uh, and, and, and he keeps pushing them. And then finally he lets them go. And there's conflict between the two coaches. Because uh, Coach Yost thinks he's pushing the kids too hard. And he says, you got to push them hard. We're going for perfection. Well, I think about that, and I think about if you're a people carer, there is a kind of emotional, spiritual exhaustion you experience that is just like that physical exhaustion. 
It doesn't matter what you do, and, and many times, and many pastors, and believe me, I'm caring for several pastors right now as a, as a personal work. And, and what, I, what I'm finding is the pastor has so many demands on him, so many things that he believes he has to do, so many things that are on that one man. And it's as though he's running in place. It's as though he has to be... Uh, you know, he has to be agile, hostile, you know, and mobile all the time. And you look at some of their schedules, and they get up early in the morning, and they, they're running the entire day, caring for people. And things come up, and things happen to people, and people hurt, and they keep moving from one thing to the next to the next. James knows he's a PK. His dad started churches all around Oklahoma. And, and, and there's, it's like... It's like there's never any rest. There's never any time to get a blow. And, and they, they're struggling. And Paul knew that. That's why he had to hurry up and write the letter. He knew he couldn't wait until he got there to buoy up this young Timothy. He knew he had to get to him quick. And that's why the, where the letter comes from. And he's going to give this young man some advice about how to get a blow. How to get relief. You know, the, the, the greatest attribute of an athlete is not while they're performing in their skill, but how they recover. Recovery time is important. If you know how to recover as an athlete, that's what makes a great athlete. The athlete that gets out there and is just all out all the time is not going to survive the, the long run. It's that athlete that's smart, that takes care of himself, knows when to pull himself out of the game, <laughs> and, and, and knows how to do all that. So he's going he's gonna to teach Timothy to put first things first. I read a study. Uh, it was put out by, a for, by the Fortune 500 magazine, and it was about executives. And it said the number one problem with executives in America is that they don't know how to think any longer. And I thought, well, that's a bold statement. And what they went on to say in the article was that most businesses, every business, and I would include the church, the business of the church, uh, it, and what we're supposed to be about it, there's only, in any company, in any business, and in any church, there's only like just a couple of priorities, whatever they are. And the problem with executives in America, according to Fortune 500 magazine, is they keep wandering off into other, into other issues, and they lose the general two or three priorities that their company stands for. Such is true of most pastors. They believe they're supposed to be running and gunning. They believe they're supposed to always be on call. They believe that they're 24-7 no matter what, and it doesn't matter what they're in the middle of or how they're feeling or what's going on in their life. They have to answer the call, and they have to keep moving, and they have to keep going. And you know what Paul says? No, you don't. Paul says, not your priorities. Not your priorities. So what are the priorities? What are first things first in ministry? Let me begin in Acts 6, 4, where it says, then, then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and the teaching of the word. This was a problem in the early church. What was happening was the, the men of God were given all these things to do, and they had to care for the people, and they had to feed people, and they had to figure out what to do with the, with the widows and the orphans, and they had to do all this different work, and they were wearing out. And the idea of deacons came up. Let's find godly men. Let's give them the assignment to go do ministry, the gift to do ministry. You remember Paul is talking to Timothy in, the first, in our first chapter, and he tells him, you know, you're a steward, you're a servant, and you're a soldier. Those three things. And to serve the people in, in Acts, you have to do exactly what they did in Acts. And what they did is they knew that they were missing out on prayer and teaching of the word. Which tells us what the two priorities are for the pastor. 
Pastors, two priorities. I don't care how big your church is. I don't care how little it is. I don't care if you're part time, if you're full time. I don't care where you serve on a particular staff. Uh, it doesn't matter what if you're in ministry and, and you're about the proclamation of the word of God. If you are called pastor, you have two priorities and you've got to think about those two, those two priorities all the time. And you can't let other busy work jump in and steal those two priorities. And they are prayer and the word of God. That's hard to read if you're me. Oh, I get involved in all kinds of stuff. Some of you are going, yeah, you get involved in too many things. But no, you, you just, by nature, you just want to get in and help. And by nature, that's what happens. But he, he, in Hebrews 4, 16, the writer says, So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Today, pastors need that grace and mercy more than any other time. It's daunting to pastor a church. Again, I don't care. I don't care size. I don't care complication. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're inner city or you're in the suburbs. It doesn't matter where you are. This is a difficult task. And if you get lost in what my Jewish friends in Yiddish would call the minutia, you're not going to do what God's called you to do. You're not going to be the steward of the word of God that he's called you to be. You're not going to be the servant of God that he's called you to be. And you're not going to be the soldier for Christ that you're supposed to be. And so Timothy was needing that word. So let's, let's dig in and look at it. Before we do that, I want to give you the four misconceptions of prayer. Because I, I realize when I say prayer, that means a lot of things to a lot of different people. Some people, it just means you bow your head and go, hmm. Some religions, you got to bow a certain direction. Some, some do all kinds of different things. But I want to identify the misconceptions of prayer that we have so that we can understand biblically what prayer is. Uh, uh, turning prayer into a public performance is not what prayer is. And so many of us are guilty of that, especially from the pulpit. You learn how to pray, and you learn how to make it sound good, and you realize you've been given the assignment to start something, and you realize that's a big deal. Maybe it's a dinner. Maybe it's an invocation somewhere. It's a wedding, and you've got to have a cool prayer. And the prayer has to have maybe a hymn in it, and maybe a psalm, and maybe another verse of scripture somewhere, and something very clever that nobody else would think to pray. And it turns into a performance. And I can just imagine God leaning over heaven going, say what? Who is that? You know, and you, and you turn English. It's thee and thou. And, and comest, O oh great Father, you know, what? You don't talk like that. Matter of fact, you know, have you ever found yourself when some old boy gets up here to pray and he starts praying, kind of peak? I didn't know he was English. I didn't know he knew Shakespeare. Hey, you know what? If you pray that way and that makes you feel comfortable and it's what God has called you to do, that's fine. That's fine. But, but don't do it for performance reasons. Prayer is to be not off the cuff, not casual, but it's to be intimate. That's different. Second misconception about prayer is that we were limiting prayer to certain places and certain times. Like, okay, we're supposed to pray here, so we're going to pray here. And then later we're going to pray here, and then later we're going to pray here. Other than that, we're not going to pray. If you ever watched, a, you ever been in a church service, because I have, where, where the pastor got up and he had the assignment to speak. And all of a sudden he said, you know what? Let's just pray. I was at a conference, big conference, huge. and had all these pastors from all over. And there was a controversy in the group. There was a huge controversy. It was, it was dividing it right down the middle. 
Uh, they were, uh, half of the group was calling pastors hirelings. And a hireling is somebody who, who was hired to watch the sheep. He wasn't a shepherd. And, and a shepherd would die for his sheep. A hireling would run because he's getting an hourly wage when the wolves came. A shepherd would pick the wolves up and protect him from the wolves. And there was a certain group of people who were believing a different kind of gospel. And you remember, that's the theme here. He's telling Timothy, watch out for false teaching. And, and there was another gospel about that, that, uh, that, that was what they called the full gospel. You know, the second touch that you get from the Holy Spirit. And it had entered in to the denomination to such a degree that there was this big divide. And he had all these great preachers there to preach. And the guy that was leading the thing, you know, he was, he was really into it. And there's all this hooping and hollering, and yet you looked around and you realized the room is divided. Seriously divided. No unity in Christ. And this great preacher who everybody came to hear got up and said, I'm going to take my time that God has given me, so graciously given me and brought me here to do and we're going to pray. And he said, I'm going to get on my knee right here. I'm going to invite you to get on your knee wherever you are. The place was packed. It was down at the convention center. And he said, and you do whatever God tells you to do. God's telling me to pray. So for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to pray. And he got on his knee. And within seconds... Really, you could hear the, the room shake and move, and you saw, saw all of us get on a knee. And, and within minutes, you heard people sobbing, and weeping. And then you heard people coming forward and, uh, and spending time with one another and talking. You saw people crossing the aisle and confessing their sin to one another. You saw people asking for forgiveness. And for 40 minutes, that went on. And then past 40 minutes and into the next man's time. It went on. You see, we're supposed to, we don't limit prayer. When we limit prayer, we begin to limit God. You never put God in a box. The third one is using prayer as a substitute for action. A lot of people do that. And I, I wanted to point that one out because a lot of people, you'll ask them to do something for God, and they'll say, well, let me, let me pray about it. You know, can you bring a casserole for the dinner? Let me pray about it. Never mind. You'd probably bring that nasty green bean onion thing anyway. <laughs> or worse, the one with peas and cream in it. What was anybody thinking on that? Uh, you know. But anyway, anyway, <laughs> the idea, the idea that we would that we would misuse <laughs> prayer as a substitute for action, that is not that is not true. Matter of fact, I'm going to say something that almost sounds heretical to you. And some of you will go, well, that is heretical, but it's really not. People all the time say, what is prayer for? It's for you. Prayer is for you. People that pray get up and do something. People that don't pray just run around like a chicken with their head cut off. I remember I used to go out, and it was one of the greatest things I got to do with my grandmother. She'd wring the neck of the chicken. And the chicken would just run around. Chicken just run around. And the old heads just, you know. And my job was to, to tackle it, get a hold of it. You know, and so we'd chase it around, you know, and finally grab it. And I remember asking her, I said, Granny, is, is the chicken dead or alive after you wring its neck? And she said, oh, it's dead. It's just too stupid to lay down. <laughs> That's the way some people do ministry, like a dead chicken. They're all over the place. They forgot to pray. It was D.L. Moody that said, I have a very busy day today. I need to take an extra hour in prayer. The idea is that, that we, we don't use it as a substitute for action. It puts you into action. One of the reasons we pray, the main reason we pray, is because it gives us God's perspective of whatever situation we're praying about and other situations that God wants us to know. That's the amazement of prayer. That's the ah, aha of prayer. 
And then making prayer a last resort. Like you realize, I have, I have no other hope but God. Hey, guess what? Let me get you on the front end before you're in the middle of an emergency. You have no other hope but God. I don't know what you think you have to hope in. I have no idea what you're hoping in. And some of you, those of you watching online, there, there might be some great hope that you have. If it's not in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's misplaced. The only hope we have in this life, and I dare say and quickly say, and our life to come, is in God. There is no hope anywhere else. That's why hope is so evasive to people. They're looking for it in something other than the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's only found in one place. So, what are we to do? First Timothy, uh, verse 1. He starts out by saying, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. So the, the first action of prayer that he's telling Timothy about, he said, don't, don't just pray for your friends, but pray for all people. Now, who's in, who's in the group of all people? Guy by you don't like? They're in the all people category. You got somebody that, uh, that, that just made you angry? One of my best prayer places is in the car. Because people make me angry when I'm driving. For no reason. They're just not going 90 to nothing like I'm going. And I come up on them and I wonder why they're going to speed limit. Well, what are you thinking? You know, and so the idea is we pray for all people and you hope all people are praying for us so he first begins with Timothy and this shows something he knows about Timothy Timothy is beginning as a pastor to favor some people in the flock because some of them are giving him a hard time some of them are hard to deal with and I you know you know what I've heard so often and I it just it breaks your heart when you're listening to a bunch of pastors talk and you know they say something like well, yeah, that guy's a troublemaker. We're just going to ice him. I'm like, what? We're going to do what? Yeah, we're going to ice him, not pay any attention to him. Just leave him adrift. Don't get his opinion on this or that. or that. And I'm, I'm thinking, what happened to 1 Timothy 2.1? I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them, to intercede for them on their behalf. And give thanks for them. So look what he's saying. He's saying, pray for people's needs. When you do that, you get clarity. You get wisdom. You get peace. Have you ever been just angry at somebody because they didn't agree with you? And, and they, you, just, you thought, you know, how, can they, how can they think that way? And then all of a sudden, so you pray for their need. And all of a sudden, you get some clarity about how they think. And you pray a little longer and you get some wisdom about what they're thinking. And you begin to realize maybe some of their thoughts combined with your thoughts is really the true right answer. And peace comes. And he talks about, he talks about pray and he says focus and be God-centered as you pray. Part of the problem is we pray and we're people-centered. That's what happens when you begin to pray for people. Usually we're self-centered, truth be told. If you can understand when you go before God, you're going before the holy God of, 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 of all, the only God, the one true God. So there is no need for you to, to, for you to, to think that you have to pray in any other way except God-focused. Some of my prayers are, God, I'm lost here. I, I, I need wisdom. What do you want done here? I love it when people come into my office, and, and as some of you may not know, but I run a counseling center during the week. That's my day job during the week. It's called HopeWorks Counseling. And it's a Christian counseling center, and I, I'll get people in there, and they'll walk in, and the one thing we want to do is define their problem. As a matter of fact, it's the first question I ask. Tell me what's going on. And people will define their problem. 
Some of them very articulately, some of them not so articulate, and they get done defining it. You know the first question I ask? Very first question. What has God told you about this? No, whoa, what? I was just trying to save you money up front. That's a big problem. Been there for a long time. You could use some counseling. But I'm guessing if you would involve God in that process and you would say, God, what do you think? I bet you're going to get a whole bunch of better answers than what I'm going to be able to give you in the next 40 minutes. Because I'm not the answer man. God can bring clarity to any situation. And then he talks about petition, uh, intimate kind of talk. Doesn't have to be thee or thou. Doesn't have, to, doesn't have to be not intimate. It can be very intimate. It, the more intimate, the better. When you were, are, are with a really good friend, you don't sit around and, and talk formally with them. You just unload your heart as one unloads one's heart to a good friend. That's what God longs for us to do, that our petitions are sounding more like conversations. Right? I just had one in the car. In the conversation with God, I'm an idiot. I'm, I'm, I've pulled up behind this poor woman. Okay, she's going 10 miles an hour slow, but why am I pushing her? What is wrong with me? And God says, well, several things. There are enormous gaps in you. You know, and, and, and you might be thinking you can live up to what it is you preach. Well, you cannot. You can only trust me and allow me to live through you. See, that's intimate. Intimate people tell you if, if the dress makes you look fat. Right? Intimate people, you know, when you, you put a shirt on, you say, hey, what do you think? They'll look at you and go, that's a great shirt. It's good color for you. They didn't have it in your size? <laughs> that's intimate talk. Then finally, he talks about Thanksgiving, the declaring of gratitude. One of the, one of the things you get when you pray and, and one of the reasons why I know a lot of people aren't praying is because you, you become this person of tremendous gratitude. You seem to be grateful for all things. That tells me you're praying. If we can't make you grateful over anything, that tells me you're not praying. And so Paul is saying, you've lost an, a bit of your gratitude, Timothy. And so that tells me you're not praying in intimacy with God. And, and one person can make a difference. I, I want you to know that one person praying can make a huge difference in this church, in a family, in a company, in a church. Uh, I, I just, the power of one. In 1645, Oliver Cromwell gained control of England. Had he not, England would have been defeated. In, in 1649, Charles I was executed by one vote. In 1776, America chose English, uh, the English language, over the German language by one vote. Just think, if we were all looking at each other going, what's this close? You go, huh? What'd he say? In 1849, Texas was admitted into the Union by one vote. In, uh, in 1868, President Andrew missed being impeached by one vote. France rejected a monarch system and became a republic by one vote. Rutherford B. Hayes won the presidency in 1876 by one vote. In 1923, this is a big one. Adolf Hitler won control of the Nazi party by one vote. And millions of people died. Now, if I get all up in your grill when it's time to vote, and you look at me and say, preacher, that's none of your business. It's every bit my business. It's every bit God's business. It's our business to be good citizens and be in the midst of being one that can make a difference. If you don't believe that, pray about it. 
Pray about it. I remember we had a prayer ministry at First Eulis, and the, and the pastor came to me and he said, I want you to pray about being in the prayer ministry. And I said, okay. And I tried to pray about it, and I, I thought, well, you don't need to pray about being in the prayer ministry. You're in the prayer ministry. You need to pray about being more effective. And that meant get a key. We prayed 24 hours. This was before they had all the stuff that you can communicate with. And, and they had a little room. And you go in this little room inside the side of the church, and there was always somebody in there. 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. It was great ministry. And, and, and it, it was the thing that trajected my heart into real prayer. You had a Rolodex. Remember those? And the, the last person would put a marker where they left off. And then you just start at that marker and you pray for the next name and the next name and the next name. And it had a, an ugly yellow phone, you know, with numbers on it. And, and, and that when that phone would ring, you'd pick it up and it'd be a prayer request. And you'd go over to the typewriter and you'd type in the prayer request and stick it in a Rolodex. And then you had a place over here where you'd write notes. Oh, man. It was glorious. You know what my time was? Two o'clock in the morning, Saturday, into Sunday. Well, actually, it was Sunday morning by the time I got there, two o'clock in the morning. Man, my Sunday naps were really welcomed back then. But you know what? You're energized. Matter of fact, there were many times the three o'clock guy didn't show up, so I just hang in there. And I take, God will really get your attention when at 3.30 in the morning, there's a knock on the door. Somebody's so desperate they don't want to call. That'll scare the living daylights out of you. One can make a difference. Uh, Twelve weeks before Pearl Harbor was hit by the Japanese, the Selective Service Act remained law by one vote. That would have crushed America. You can make a difference, and praying does make a difference. Now, so for whom are we to pray? This is tough. Buckle up. Look at what he says. Pray this way for kings. Here it comes again. And all who are in authority so that, th th that we can live peaceably in quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. Let me read that again. You all know who your king is? You know who your vice king is? You know who your kings are in the Senate and the Congress? These are all people you love, I know. All. Pray for the kings. Here's the thought I had, and I know it's true. I know it's true because I was praying about it. Uh, would our world be in the state that it is in today, in terms of leadership, if God's church and God's people we're really correctly praying for leaders. I think not. I think you'd have a whole, whole different bunch. I think, I, I, I agree with, I, I agree with uh, uh, James Adams who said, you get exactly the government you deserve. I believe he was saying that to Christians. Uh, I also was thinking, well, who was Timothy praying for? Who was the king? It would, it would be a Caesar. It would be somebody in Rome. It would be somebody who hated Christians. It would be somebody who was putting Christians to death. That was their leadership, and he was to pray for them. And, and, the, and the reward, the benefit, is a peaceable life. Uh, godliness, dignity. Now, you may not get out alive. Because Paul prayed for the kings. Paul prayed for, for the Roman government. Paul ended up arrested by the Roman government. He ended up being beheaded by the Roman government. But he also won many of them to Christ because he was praying for them. And he was godly and he had dignity and his life was peaceable in his heart. Maybe not in circumstances. So prayer, what's the motive? In verses 3 and 4, he says, this is a good, this is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants 
everyone, all again, all, everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. The benefits is that prayer pleases the heart of God. And the motivation of our prayer should always be the salvation of the lost. Your motivation ought to be the thoughts that you have that are like a lost man. Your thoughts that are like a sinner. And it always ought to include praying for people to come to know Christ as their personal Savior. Look at 5 and 6, because this is the truth of the gospel. He goes on, and it's as though he's talking about, about prayer, and he can't help himself but to talk directly about the gospel, because prayer and the gospel are indivisible. It says, For there is one God, one mediator, who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone, for all. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. Do you understand that in, in these two verses, there is more gospel, and you've just heard it read to you, than most of the world has ever heard. And much of the world is not hearing in our culture. Look at what he's saying. There's one God. There's only one person. One God. There's not multiple gods. It's not, you know, I just need to, I just need to relax. And if you've got a different God other, than, uh, other than, than, than the Lord God himself, I'm supposed to accept that and, and, uh, and let you have your way. And, and people say, you know, you're just supposed to let and let live. The gospel is designed to be confrontive. The gospel is real clear. There's one God. Not multiple gods. That's why he's telling Timothy, watch out for these guys who say that it's God plus this, God plus that. It's God Almighty. And you say, that's narrow. Truth is always narrow. Science is narrow. Creation is narrow. H2O is always water. H3O isn't water. I don't even know what H3O is. A weird man chemical. One God. One mediator. What's a mediator? A mediator is like a referee. A referee, and he keeps, he keeps the game going, keeps it moving. It's orderly. Jesus Christ is our mediator. The only way that we get to God is through his son. That is the arrangement that the, that the Trinity made in, in eternity past. There, there would be one God. One God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And God would be the mediator. He is, he is the person taking your prayers to the throne of God. We have one mediator. There's no order without the mediator. I'm watching the uh, NBA Finals. And, and what's, what's it like without a referee? Chaos. Life without a mediator is chaos. If you're living your life, you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, and, and you have no prayer life, and you're wondering what's wrong with your life, you're living in absolute chaos because you don't have a mediator between you and God. You just have one, you haven't recognized it. And he says, and then there's, there's, there's the God-man, that, uh, that the one man, Jesus Christ, the one and only, there, is not, there, is, there are not other men that came to reconcile you with God, only Jesus. That was his reason for coming. That was the plan. For who? All of humanity. All. All of humanity. Only God is qualified to free us. And only God came to free us. Only God can free us. I love uh, the words of Ian Thomas. He said, The life Jesus lived qualified him for the death that he died. And the death that Jesus died qualifies us to live the life he lived. He is your substitute, your mediator. The only way to God. I just love it. I love the way Paul writes. He's just so brilliant. Just, 
He's talking about prayer, and then all of a sudden, he's sharing the gospel. He's talking about prayer, and then within a sentence or two, he gives the gospel. And it, it, it tells me again how simple the gospel is. It's not complicated. It's accepted by faith, and that makes people think it's more complicated. But the gospel is clear, easy to understand. Difficult for some people to accept, and yet true. Well, in, in uh, verse 7, he, he, after he has said this, he gives some reasons why he would say it. He said, and I have been chosen as a preacher and an apostle and to teach the Gentiles this message about faith and truth, and I am not exaggerating, just telling the truth. Well, Paul is saying, I'm three things. I'm a preacher. You know what a preacher is? A preacher is a, pro a public herald for God. Remember, back in the old days when there was a king and the king would have an edict, the, the, the herald would go out into the square and he would open whatever it was that the king uh, had ordered. And he'd say, hear ye, hear ye, and he'd read it out. And, and it was the truth. It came from the king. And you knew if it was his herald saying it, it was the truth. And Paul's saying, I am a herald for the gospel. I am a preacher. And that's my job. You know, when you, when you think about the church and, and how, how the, the church will always exist because Jesus claimed that it would. And he said, upon this rock, I will build my church. He's talking about on this rock-like truth. The church will always have a preacher. And he goes on, he says, and I'm, I'm an apostle. An apostle was one sent forth, one sent forth to share what the Holy Spirit was giving him as he was writing it down. And there are now no longer any more apostles. The work of the apostle is done because Scripture is finished. We have the canon of Scripture. We have the books that the Holy Spirit has preserved, and we have gotten it through many different Ways and it's been put together, and it is the most trustworthy piece of literature that has ever been discovered. It is more true than a book that somebody is writing today or that will publish tomorrow. So there's no longer a need for an apostle. If somebody gets before you and says, I'm an apostle, and I have this extra word from God that's, you know, the Bible plus this word, no. That's over with. That ended with the Apostle Paul and the 12 disciples. So then he also says, and a teacher, to teach. One who explains. One who clearly explains. So today's herald, those who are called preachers, our job is to pray, and then our job is to preach the word and teach it. At the same time, do it with an evangelistic approach. Unpologetically stand and say, God is the one true God. The Bible is true. It's true. From the table of contents to the maps. Everything in between. It is God's holy word. That's a pastor's job. To teach about it. That's why, that's why I don't come up with subjects and and, and, and long different kind of series that we have, and you get to hear my wisdom on something, I won't do that to you. I won't do that to me. I preach verse by verse because I'm supposed to do that as a proclaimer. Teach through what? The Word of God. Not my opinion, but the Word of God. Then, verse 8, how should it be done? Uh, he says, in every place of worship, I want men to pray with holy hands lifted up to God, free from anger and controversy. Now, he's not saying lift your hands in prayer. You can do that. That doesn't bother me a bit. You want to go a little crazy, Matic? Lift your hands up when we pray? That's fine. That's fine, but that's not the purpose of the verse. What he's talking about is clean hands. He's talking about that you're not a sinner who is victimizing people. 
You do it with clean hands. You do your worship with a clear conscience. It is apart from sin. You, you, you do prayer by first asking God to forgive the sin that is in your life, the big gaps that are there. A lot of preachers fail because they preach things and they realize, I can't live up to that. Well, if you stopped every time you couldn't live up to whatever it was you would preach, you would never preach. I love it when people say, well, I didn't come to church because I didn't feel good. Good night. If I waited till I felt good to go anywhere, I wouldn't go anywhere. I haven't felt good for a decade. I just know I feel better once I get up. It's the only thing I can count on at this point. See, the idea is, the idea is that we come to God. We confess our sins. We recognize that without him we are nothing. That's the way he wants us to pray. Then he also wants us to pray apart from anger. You know, over in 1 Peter, Peter tells the, the husbands, you know, if you're angry with your wife, your prayer's not even getting heard. He's saying when you're angry in this one focused kind of relationship, if you're not in good stead there, forget it, buddy. You better get that right first. Over in Matthew, God says, you know, if, if your brother has something against you, which means if you're angry at him, he's angry at you, stop praying, get up. Go reconcile with him. So that God can hear your prayers. That's what he's talking about. And then he says, apart from controversy. You know, controversy. Controversy to Paul was moving away from what was truth. Controversy for him was moving away from what is biblical. And that should be controversy for us today. I get it. It's not controversy for our culture. I realize we are viewed as the controversial ones. But the truth is, controversy meaning not in a disparaging relationship with God, but one with him in spirit and in truth, allowing the Holy Spirit to give you joy. Let me give you three helpful hints, and then I'm out of here. The first one, the first helpful hint is create a habit of prayer. I need to write a diet book because, you know, the diet books are so easy to write. They all say the same thing. A lot of words, but what they say is eat less, exercise more. I mean, when you boil it all down, you can read the whole thing. Might even be good. But the point is you have to build a different habit of eating or nothing will change. So you have to build a habit around prayer, which means you got to think through specific times. I, I tell you all the time, I pray before I get up. When I wake up, I thank God that I woke up. Amen. It's short, short, sweet prayer. God, thank you. I know a lot of people died in their sleep last night. I'm glad I wasn't one of them. I'm glad that I, if I was one of them, I'd be with you. And then you're up. And then you got nothing to do in the shower but clean yourself. While you're there, pray. You got nothing to do while you're shaving but shave. Pray. Pray without ceasing. He says that in 1 Thessalonians. Pray like a hacking cough. You ever had a hacking cough? Horrible thing to have today. <laughs> you, you, go out and, you go out in public and you cough, people look at you like, like you're evil. You know, it's just a cough. You know, take it somewhere else. So, create a habit. Second thing, don't place any limits on your prayer life. Now, you're thinking, oh, yeah, this is the old God can do anything. Well, absolutely he can. But you know where most people limit God? They limit God in the stuff that they think they can do. I limit God on all the things that I think I can do well. Don't bring him in. You know, the little things in life, the, the, the little bitty things in life that, that you think you're really good at, and you don't ask God to really help you or give you wisdom around it. You know, hey, I'm about to greet a person. Oh, I know how to do that. I'm good at that. I'm a schmoozer. I know how to buzz the room. 
I know how to feel it. I know how to get in there, grin at you, make eye contact, web up when we shake, punch good if we're just punching. We all let down. But hey, what about if you involve God? God, give me the strength to remember that person's name. Mm. How many of you meet somebody and you walk away going, what was their name? Forgot it. Right when you left them. You know, if, if you knew there was going to be a quiz later, but if you prayed, God, I want to meet this person. I want to meet them. I remember their name. Can, you, can we do that? God will help. It's the little things. It's the little things that, that, that make the big things work. If you don't do the little things right, the big things will never occur. Then the third thing, ask God first. All things come up in your life. Ask him first. Always consider him first. Consider his word first. It's not difficult. It's the smartest, easiest thing you can do. Got him in a situation, what do I do? What's going to honor you? What's going to glorify you? I bet me losing my temper and going crazy is not what you want. Right? Ask God first. Create a habit. Don't place any limits on God at the, at the small end or the big end. And ask God first. You know what we're going to do for our invitation? We're going to pray. Do you, right where you are, you're going to pray. And, and, and I'm going to ask you to take whatever position of prayer you like. You want to stand up and pray? Great. You want to sit and pray? Great. You want to get on your knees and pray? Great. You want to come down here and, and, and bow in, in front? Come do that. But we're going to pray. We're going to pray. And God tells us, pray for all people. Pray for people in need. I'm going to ask everyone of you to pray for Dorothy Clothier. She had to go to the hospital. Her blood pressure's way up. They don't know why. Last week, her blood pressure was way low. They don't know why. So I want you to pray that, that, that God will give the doctors wisdom, and they'll take care of our sweet Dorothy and place her in, you, in, in the Lord's hands. And you can pray for the family. And you can, you can pray from there for somebody else that you know that has a need. You can pray for yourself. You can pray that God will allow you to develop a habit. That God will help you to not limit him. That God will remind you to come to him first. So as, as the band gets up here and they sing, I'm going to start us in prayer. And we're going to spend our invitation time in prayer. If God tells you to join this church, join. Be obedient to whatever it is that God says to do. You know, you know when, when, um, when they did a study about decision making, they found out that when people have uh, a time to think about something, they usually make the right decision or the decision they're going to make within the first three minutes. If they're given more time to make the decision, they will make other decisions. But then when they're pressed to what is the final decision, they will come back to really about the first 30 seconds of what they thought. Why? Because God gave you a brilliant mind. And he's guiding you. And before you know, he knows. And when you pray, you see it from his perspective. You feel his love. You experience his joy. So church, pray. Father, thank you. Thank you, God, that you want us in conversation with you at all times, in all ways, about all issues. So God, we come to you in our absolute surrender to you for a sweet hour of prayer in Jesus' name. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing the one
Grace is found is where you are and where you Father, we do need you, and we welcome you, and we love you, and we thank you. We are so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to know you, to be saved, to know that when this life ends, life everlasting begins with you. We thank you, God, for our mediator, Jesus, for the God-man, Jesus Christ, who came, lived a sinless life, died for all sinners, all mankind that all could be saved and know you. Father, help us to be the sharers of that good news. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want you to go home and hurry up and come back because we're coming back at 5 o'clock. Where are you, Becky? We're coming back at 5 o'clock, right? Tell us what we're going to get to see again because you're better at it than anybody. Me, go ahead. You'll just correct me along the way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, we're going we're gonna to come back at 5 o'clock. And uh, what's his name? Dwayne Lee. Dwayne Lee. Uh, Dwayne Lee is going to bring a multimedia presentation about Normandy. And I promise you it's going to be awesome. Uh, it'll be kind of, kind of his account and a truthful account. And, you know, this is a good time to do this. It's a good time to be a great patriot for our nation and to remember kind of what happened. We just had Memorial Day, but this is just kind of a cherry on top to be able to see what happened during those hours and the bravery of the men, the men who made a difference in the world, who stopped Hitler in his tracks and the amazing things that they did and how they put themselves in harm's way, and many of them, died. It'll be a great thing for us to come see. It's a good thing to invite your neighbors. If you have friends and people you know, it'd be a great thing to bring them to. And when it's over, we're going to have a snack. Okay, but the men's put together the snack. And so the snack's going to be babe's chicken. So that's what I call a snack. And I told you last week, you know, don't, don't, don't come around and go, do you have anything baked? No. No, we're frying everything. So uh, I like that fried chicken because it, you know, you can tell it's going to go right to your heart. Um, so we're going to have a wonderful time together and a time of fellowship. Pray the rain doesn't come unless God wants it to come. If it comes, we'll all be crowded somewhere eating a piece of chicken after hearing wonderful things about Normandy. This is such a good time for us because, you know, we've lost our our fellowship building, and I know if you're like me, you're just missing being together, just missing hanging out. And so that's really uh, what the second part of tonight will be. So please come back. Uh, we, will, we can celebrate together, and it'll be fun. All right? Okay. I've prayed about it. You're all supposed to come back and bring people. 
Sing us out. All right. Lord, I need Oh God.